Okay, good morning everyone. It is morning, yes. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Centre for Agriculture, Water and Resilience and thank you very much for coming along. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about why is it that a centre working on agriculture and alternative food networks and human well-being feels it's important to have artists in residence. It's quite unusual for many uh, institutions in formal academia to mix uh, social and natural scientists with artists. And we've, we've done it. We've been able to do this at Coventry. And um, this is important for us because as a centre, we, um, we're committed to transdisciplinary ways of knowing, uh, to develop socially just and resilient food systems throughout the world. And um, our work does bring together social and natural scientists, and we try and combine that with the knowledge of ordinary, we're often extraordinary people, farmers, water users, men, women, people of different ethnic groups. So quite a lot of our work aims to walk the talk of transdisciplinary ways of knowing. Um, and there's a lot of methodological innovation around that, and tensions, because it's not easy. Um, now, within that mix, there has to be a place for the arts and humanities. It's not just social and natural scientists and people's knowledge, but there's also what people with artistic, uh, sensual sensit sensitivities can bring to this whole field of inquiry and transformation. And I, I found a lovely quote from James Hayward Rowling, some of you know. He basically puts it very well. The arts and sciences are twin peaks in human cognition, and neither should be privileged in research processes. Mm -hmm. So I think that summarizes quite well what we're trying to do. It doesn't mean that we're doing it, we're aiming to do it. As I said, it's very difficult. And many of you who work in institutions, bureaucracies, know that it's very difficult to actively disrupt hierarchies of knowledge and the vested interests behind it. There's lots of politics that we deal with. But anyway. Um, and transdisciplinarity affirms this essential unity of all knowledge working within disciplines, between disciplines and beyond disciplines. And that's very important. And that provides, in my little head, the rationale for inviting artists, writers, poets, yeah. artists, sculptures to the centre. Yeah. And the first two we invited were Flora, um, Kate von Hardy and Mich, I'm going to confuse the names now, yeah? we call them Mich and Flo, um, <laughs> Mich Lewin, Fabre Lewin, as artists in residence. Quite early on in the life of Court, it was within the first year that we invited you as research mm. associates. You know, the honeymoon period, these things are possible. So we, we did it. Um, and uh, Mich and Flora have been with us for all that time, um, doing their own work, also. Uh, um, engaging, interacting with various people in the core, and gradually establishing a program work which we'll hear about. But today, uh, Mish and Flora are going to have a seminar, which they've entitled The Art of Collaboration for Knowledge Justice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've all received a little blurb about that, so maybe I shouldn't say too much in the interest of time, because if I start talking, I go on. <laughs> uh, but it's a fascinating topic, the art of collaboration for knowledge justice. We put a lot of emphasis on the epistemic justice, cognitive justice, as we try and bring together the knowledge systems of indigenous peoples, minority groups, uh, gay communities, uh, with formal academic knowledge in the social and natural science. This question of cognitive justice, epistemic justice, is very, very important. But there are other knowledges which possibly artists can alert to alert us to, and that refers probably to the multiple intelligences that we have and uh, more or less well worked with. Not just cognitive intelligence, but the emotional intelligence and many other intelligences. And on that I'll stop because these two ladies here are much better equipped than I am to talk about that. So over to you. Thank you. And, uh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, first of all, I must take my hat off to all of you and to thank you so much for um, joining us here. But as I say, especially to um, Michelle and to Julia, because it's really because of them that I 
was even in the position to be invited to do a PhD. And this is what I'm going to take you on a journey with, alongside my thinking partner, Furoke Thonghadi, who, again, another pioneering um, uh, acceptance from such a, an institution as Core and Coventry, that I, as a PhD who was doing my PhD, could invite someone to be my thinking partner who's not doing thinking for me, mm -hmm. but is hearing my thinking and being a reflector. So, welcome. Um, we're going to do this, we think. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody else who needs to be in the room, and that's um, Dr. Chris Seeley, who sadly passed away um, at the outset of your PhD, Mish. Um, but we feel these words capture exactly the marriage between what you're doing, Mish, with your doctoral research, what we're doing as a practice, a collaborative practice, and what CORE is, is seeking to do. And, and Chris says it very beautifully, if both we and the other than human world are to flourish, then we must exercise our responsibility to become more wholly human, not merely acknowledging that we come to know in diverse ways, but to actually live and be in ways which invite the artful and the intellectual, the embodied and the theoretical, the hearty and the heady, with equal thoroughness and enthusiasm. And I think that's what you were referring to, Michelle. Um, and Chris, who would have been my supervisor, has been alongside me in spirit. I do believe that people on the other side are, have as much um, to contribute as our, our, our mortal selves. So she has been very profoundly um, bringing things into the PhD which I couldn't have even known. Like I've had access to her library and um, there are days when a particular book will just fall out or um, uh, there'll be some clowning uh, little moment that I know Chris has just come in to get my attention back. And so she's been very much with me on the journey. Um, as Michelle said, very briefly to introduce people who don't know about our relationship to CORE, as, as Michelle said, in 2013 we were invited to be Artist Research Associates and we've been on some really wonderful journeys here, the collaborative design laboratory that we did when CORE was, as you say, in the honeymoon period, just beginning to find its community and its identity and its visual language. And then that led to, to Mish being invited to do a PhD to reflect on her practice. Um, this, is, this is in South Africa. You'll hear more. We're going to go through a series of um, interactions and engagements that happened as part of my field research in South Africa. And then the arc of, of our time with you today until one is that we're going to begin with the body and we shall take you on a journey that begins with the body and begins with this place here. Um, then as we said, we're going to share, we going to share a of her, uh, just a little piece of her doctoral research but which allows us to drop into um, examples of collaborative um, practice in the field. And then the final piece will, as, as Michelle was alluding to, we're going to talk about the trajectory moving forwards, of which you are a very formative part. So, the art of collaboration. What makes it an art? What I'd love to invite us all into is an encounter now with some matter, something of the natural world. We have a little bit of the garden and the, the wild in here. Um, because in a way, the dialogue for myself and for Flora in our collaboration has always been the collaboration is not just with our own human selves. It's also with our relationship to um, the other beings, the other elements um, of the natural world and the more than human world. So,
The invitation is now for us to have an encounter with each other, with some materials, uh, and to open ourselves to the question, what is collaboration? And to enter into that wherever we feel it inside ourselves. It might have been an experience, it might be something we would wish for, it might be um, something we've got no idea about what it is. But <clears throat> bringing all of our senses into any encounter means that we're not just going to go, ah, what do I think about it? What I'm inviting us to do is, first of all, to choose a card. Choose a card that in some way evokes something to you about collaboration. Whatever it is, any association. Don't even try and um, elaborate on it. Just what does the card, what card picks you to help you share something about what you feel collaboration is or might be. So this is going to be quite a, a sort of hastening slowly kind of experience. In silence, find your card and also at the same time pick up a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper and then get back to where you're sitting. And then we'll move into the next bit. So first, choose a card that in some way associates, triggers the meaning of association for you of collaboration and pen and two paper. Just muse with your card and let your card share with you. to a pause because things are always ongoing, nothing's ever finished or stopped or in a time of nature. But in a way, these musings around what is collaboration are already, we have entered into an art. There's an art fullness to how we even began to encounter the question. The cards, the, the way of laying it out, it's like we're always in a continuing understanding that aesthetics, the word aesthetic, comes from being in our senses, feeling form, esthesis. To be anaesthetized is to not have feeling form. <laughs> so the idea of um, being in spaces where we're always creating beauty and bringing something that inspires the senses will already be inviting us to open our hearts to kinds of collaborations that are have depth. So now, if you're happy to have your um, cards and notes yielded to Flora, who's going to put them up on the washing line, we will then come back to them in the third phase of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. So that was a, a, a little encounter which is about a process of emptying ourselves of association. So we can come to the next encounter, a little sort of free of what's been inside us in terms of what might collaboration mean. And what I'm going to invite you to do now is look around the room and you might like someone's shoes, you might like what they're wearing, you might like their piece of jewellery, you might like something that sort of struck you about the way they have their hair done or um, something that you noticed. And if you can find yourself a partner where already there was some, inside yourself, there was some little association, some resonance, some link. Or it might be the opposite. Someone that you really thought, hmm, that's not someone I really could ever get on with. <laughs> so let yourself be found by another. Okay? And then move to be with them. Well, actually, before that, before that let's, get, let's get ourselves well protected. First of all, Find yourself. Laura and I, our collaboration is called Touchstone for a very, very real reason. We became touchstones for each other. 
in our collaboration. Before our collaboration began in our own separate worlds, we became thinkers and, and sensors and reflectors for each other's different practices. And we kept using the word touchstone, and then we discovered one day, let's try and understand what that means. Then we became collaborators, and the word touchstone became our, in a way, it's our metaphor, because a touchstone is a piece of basalt, some piece of rock from deep, deep within the soil, deep within the earth's crust, which is a way of making a measure, a testing of whether an alloy is a true gold or a false gold. Mm -hmm. So when you strike that particular alloy, a particular mark will measure whether it's true or not. So the idea was that we were inviting ourselves to find our true genius, our true gold in ourselves, and that our collaboration was, in effect, to bring that into the world that wherever we were working with people, we were inviting in a relationship to our true gold, our genius, our imagination, our feelings, our memories, our experiences, so everybody's experience was given the same value. So that felt as a, a beautiful way of inviting you today to discover touchstones in yourselves and through a collaboration that is a potential. This idea is, is that we're going to choose a touchstone. These stones have come from where we now live, which is near um, in, in Suffolk, and we went to a beautiful shingle street called Albra, which is a beach uh, full of shingle, and these stones yielded themselves to be brought here. And these are touchstones for you all to um, keep, so to choose one and to keep it, and that's going to take us into the next encounter. So, find yourself a touchstone. That'll give you courage for the next, <laughs> <laughs> the next <laughs> process. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's good. You find all your ways. So now you know what's coming. <laughs> maybe that was. Maybe I didn't make a mistake. Maybe that is a good way to do it. Wrong. So this, this, this again to maybe share that um, what we're sharing with you is not a process and a formula. We've never done this before. Everything we come to, we always come to new. We come to the spirit of the place. We come to the spirit of the intention, the people, what's being invited. So obviously some of these artifacts and, the, and, the, and the, the cards are things that I use, but it, this has been beautifully um, brought together just for this event with you to share about the art of collaboration. So choose someone that you'd like to have the next encounter with. And it won't necessarily be forever, but it might. <laughs> <laughs> you never know when you begin something. So I encourage you to just and if you've chosen, um, maybe just um, let me know, and then we find out who needs to still find a pair. Move around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. move around. Yeah, yeah, just move around and find, find someone, and then sit with them. Yes, you can. my camera. And it is, it is a risk to deeply collaborate with someone and to deeply collaborate as a, a medium of being. So, now the idea is that one of you is going to take the stone and give it, give your voice to the stone, essentially, and share something about what is it to collaborate. If you were to begin a collaboration, a deeply meaningful collaboration. How would you begin? So each of you is going to begin to share with the other, with the attention of your touchstone partner, without any interruption, whoever has the first stone speaking through the body of the human, of course, um, is going to have that space to share what it might mean to begin the collaboration. What would make it right for you? What would make it safe for you to begin a collaboration? Or it might be, I've done many collaborations and I would like to find another way of doing a collaboration. So basically, it's to just come from your heart, 
You are beginning a collaboration for something really significant. How would you like to begin? And this first person that you've met is the person who you're going to essentially evolve this collaboration with. So each of you are going to share your way of doing it and value it and respect it and in a way give space that there's no questioning or interruption. Each person will really have the floor when they have their stone being the speaking through. Does that, is that, are there any questions about that? Do we have a set amount of time? And then we'll, so we'll notionally, because I'm really not interested in clock time. I like living by Kairos time, which is the rhythm of the seasons, the rhythm of the moon, the rhythm of the energy. But let's go for a notional um, three minutes each. A kind of three, three minutes to three centuries. Yeah? Remember, we're in quantum time, three minutes to three centuries. Right, so choose the first person who's going to speak. The other person will give their loving, um, respectful attention and just listen and receive. Okay, very good. So, we've been on a little research journey, and we have been together in a touchstone um, attention with each other to give ourselves time and space to just consider what would it be meaningful for you to begin a collaboration, how would we do it? And maybe just to give a little um, picture of how our collaboration started between myself and Flora, it was a notion, yes, we'd like to collaborate, but what on and why? And is it needed? And we spent a long time before <coughs> anything actually became a collaborative project or initiative on just really deepening into our own relationship. And we began with a basket. We each brought a basket to each other, filled with things that were meaningful to us. And that's how we began to, and as we unpacked what was in the basket, that was a sharing of ourselves with each other. So. You were sharing something of yourself through the stone <coughs> with the attention of another. Probably that is the most meaningful part of any collaboration, is that there's a deep, authentic empathy for opening up to who is another person. And in fact, all the work we've been doing over the years, it's been so clear that despite campaigns, despite strategies, despite PowerPoints, things don't really, really take or um, grow unless there's real depth of trust and connection between another human being um, for any meaningful change to happen. So I thank you and appreciate so much the time and the energy that you um, entered into this with. Um, and now just let's have a little moment of hearing something that came out of those exchanges and then this will bring this part to a close and then I would like to go through a slide presentation of the collaboration that happened as part of my research in South Africa. But for the moment, it'd be great to just get a feeling of how you have experienced this um, moment of sharing touchstones of collaborative potential. <clears throat> It's for all of us. It's not. It's not for me or for us. It's for us. <coughs> what came through? Surprises? Things you knew? No, I think the starting point was was that it was okay to have a conversation, <laughs> and that conversation could be on a particular subject, or as often happens with conversations, something arises which is completely unexpected. Mm. So I think that the fact that it's okay to, whether you're friends or whether you're enemies, you know, to 
and to talk. Mm. I quite like having a stone. Um, I, I, I've, I, you know, I've been in discussions where there's a thing that gets passed around before, but in this situation, I really like having a stone because um, I felt like I didn't have to. I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit weird. I can't really explain it, but it felt like I could, I could sort of communicate with somebody who I've only met maybe once before, but I had this thing to hold on to, and it actually, I, it made me think of lots of different cultural traditions where people are used to handling things, uh, rosaries or beads or, you know, where where th there is deep deep root to, to holding something in your daily process that you're talking or having a cup of tea or whatever. So, I don't know, I, I, I enjoyed that. It kind of made me think about time. Mm. Because I guess, I'm just wondering whether the stone made me think about time, because that's what we spoke about. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what I spoke about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, in the interest of us continuing to learn about each other, could we have the names as you share something? Clive, Clive Adams. Jane, Jane Trowell. Thank you. Mm. For me, it, <clears throat> I think, like all in my experiences of collaboration, there's always an element of surprise, and I think, and also a sort of mirroring somehow. I, I started, and I spoke. I, I suspect I said many things that Jane might have said about collaboration, and then she said she responded in a very different way but also saying what I might have said if I'd been in a different moment <coughs> somehow, if that makes sense. It was a mirroring of almost like, it simplifies it too much, but I was very much talking about the sort of positive qualities of collaboration and from my, in my experience how it's absolutely core, etc. it is to all my work. And, and Jane, there was maybe a little sort of a note of, sort of caution of the sort of possible, the, you know, the fact that it has to be the right time, it has mm. to be the right moment. So there's that sort of somehow mirroring of, of, of the sort of, yeah, so let's celebrate it, but there's also the shadow side mm -hmm. of it, that you know, it can go terribly wrong, and it's all about the right timing. Mm -hmm. You can meet someone and feel, God, I really want to work with that person. Mm -hmm. Like I met Jane three, four years ago, whatever, for you, mm -hmm. and I, had, I personally had that thought. <clears throat> so it might not happen at that time, it's not yeah. the right time, yeah. but it might happen yeah. much later, or it may never happen if the timing doesn't. So there's that kind of, mm. I thought that was really interesting. Mm. So we've got a conversation as a beginning, the idea of time and mirroring. Mm. We've got very, very much in agreement that thinking who we are, what we believe in, what is important to us, is a very important element to engage in a collaboration. We also acknowledge that it's very difficult to have a meaningful, deep collaboration with individuals who have, that have fundamentally different values on some, and that we couldn't kill ourselves, you know, that collaboration break down. Mm -hmm. So hence the importance of actually spending time discovering each other at the beginning of the relationship. It's not about talking about work and research. Mm -hmm. It's who am I with us? Where am I coming from? What what matters to me? Mm -hmm. So, hmm, I think it's learning about the wholeness of that human being, mm -hmm. with whom I think you might be able to spend some time doing stuff, but that doesn't matter. It's the wholeness of the human being, and, and mm -hmm. understand what's really what what is shared, what's common, mm -hmm. and that provides the base to go further in a, in a collaboration, uh, and it's essential for trust building because you feel mm -hmm. part there. We're part of the same affinity, the same mm. um, school of thought, or mm. very important values are shared by both of us. So that's an act of trust, and then you can go further after that. So, well, okay, we want to work together, but how do we work together? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I imagine that values are not enough, that you mm. know, individuals can be very organized and others very messy, but we have to sort of come to terms with that. And how do we evolve? You know, agreed ways of working together, sorting that out. But that's so much easier if there is that complicity. 
which we found. And kind of the right complicity. Yeah. Yeah. Any more little thoughts? You know that we're going to come back to some of this uh, towards uh, as part of the last. It's interesting for me. I, I find collaboration quite a loaded word in a way. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of seems in a work context with an instrumental goal, um, perhaps. And then maybe something like friendship is a more open word. And then mm -hmm. it's the broader social context in which an interaction mm -hmm. happens. And then we were talking about this and we, we made the point, because I, I mean, I agree, that's for me what collaboration is with someone who shares the same values. But then should we be collaborating with people that we don't share the same values with to achieve a broader <coughs> so Should we be looking to work with other people who are quite different and uh, share, have different values, but then something better comes out of the collaboration? Mm -hmm. But that's how I feel. Well, that's a lovely, lovely um, point to maybe share the slideshow, because in a way we were we were put into a position where I would say that um, the collaboration and the field work came out of relationship, and it it was with people that I would never have known that I could have such empathy with because I didn't know them, uh, and maybe that's a point now to share this, and then we can come back to this. Does that feel like a good moment? Thank you so much for all of these um, offerings. Okay, now finally I can do something really simple, which is I can just... This was a collaboration that began in, in the Cradle of Humankind in South Africa, um, but that's just a beautiful memory and a thanksgiving. But what we're going on to is... You just swipe it, I guess it's the other way. Okay, oh, that's the one. There you go. To be an artist means integrating one's art and one's life, bringing the arts into daily life and making life itself an arena for aesthetic and ethical acts. I would say, I believe that what I'm seeking to do through my research, through my life in the world, is to bring aesthetic and ethical into the same conversation. Briefly, I started with my doctoral research began in 2016. 2015, I, my proposal was accepted. In 2016, we went to South Africa. And because of some work that we did there in relation to um, our um, connection with Coventry University and Stellenbosch University, a whole set of serendipitous outcomes um, came to be and adventures that I went on and that became the research as an artist. So we were invited, we were uh, looking to have a research exchange where my research was going to be a benefit to the Sustainability Institute, which is linked to Stonewash University, called it Living Cultures, Kitchen Culture Meets Agriculture. It was to bring the garden and the kitchen into a live relationship with each other. The Sustainability Institute um, runs master's programs on sustainable uh, living and urban experiences. Uh, it's very wide and people come from all over the world and it's very multicultural. This was the proposal that we made when we were invited to do something and that proposal became my research. So just even the way we entered into the um, approach of a proposal was to share the cycles um, that had already happened to show that there was a lineage, oops, a lineage to what then became Kitchen Culture Meets Agriculture. Coventry University, Pulse Residency, where we worked in South Africa at Stellenbosch University for a week's residency, which then led to the invitation to Kitchen Culture Meets Agriculture, and we proposed the theme of food citizenship as a way of bringing together a day in the life of the Sustainability Institute and to draw a beautiful arc of connection between what happens with the teaching, what happens with the eating, what happens in the garden, what happens in the kitchen. So students have an actual embodied experience of that. <coughs> so these are my three workshops. I call them food ritual workshops. And they were called ritual workshops because it was not a ritual, it was not a workshop. The idea was that people would come with a particular kind of focus 
and enter into an inquiry with me and become a researcher with themselves and with matter. And all the matter was an experience with food. Compost and how food can become compost and become food for the earth. The next one is called Wild Cultures. It was about the idea of how do we bring um, fermentation processes into a culture where there's a lot of poverty and actually the, the fermentation is a way of preserving foods. It's also a way of preserving um, uh, foods that are surplus and it's very economic and it's very transforming and enlivening and it's really good for the gut. So not only for the brain and the gut but also for social, secure, social and food security. So that was called Wild Cultures and Honeycomb Conversations was the third one and that was about bringing the idea of bees and the experience of a, a natural hive into a workshop and giving people a taste of honey and understanding that this amount of honey on the tiny end of your nail represents one bee's lifetime of gathering honey. So people actually could experience the taste of the politics of it. I am now going to go through uh, a day in the life. So I've put together um, a slide show, and the day is essentially a day which goes through the, uh, the cycle, but it's not necessarily from the same workshop. So it will give you a sort of a feel. So first of all, we had, I think that's easier for me, thank you. First of all, we had a beautiful studio. And as a residency, the first thing you've got to ask for is you need a space where you can kind of have your cave, your sort of your base, your laboratory, your um, uninterfered with musing, dreaming space. We got a beautiful space right in the heart of the Sustainability Institute to make our own. We had it, wasn't due to be for a month, and it became three months. So this is me setting up for a workshop. This is setting up for the Wild Cultures workshop in the Sustainability Institute guest house where we were lodged for the time that we were there. That's very important to be with the place. That really gives you a feeling, you get to know the people, you have these kinds of ordinary interactions with people, and you get a feel of what might need to happen. All of these workshops actually were devised because of knowing the place. We didn't just come in with, oh, I think I do think I'd like to just do fermentation. It was there was a political um, a reason, but also um, a social reason. Then the day began with all the students going and having an experience in the kitchen garden, which is the potager, which is about 250 yards from the kitchen where people were fed, the students were fed. So then that's in the garden, everyone is having some feel and experience. So then to the kitchen with what's been foraged. And in the kitchen, Flora was hosting the gardening side. I was in the kitchen preparing it with the cook, Raz, to um, invite everybody into the kitchen to then start actually having a relationship with the food in order to prepare it for the food citizen lunch, which happened at one o'clock. This is what I call tribal cooking, in a different sense, which is that all the food is cooked. I introduced this to Raz, he loved that idea, and he works with it now. That all the food is cooked independently. You don't have a recipe, the menu is from the garden. So you won't know what you're eating, right until the moment, 10, 15 minutes before, when you bring all the food together that's been cooked, and start putting it together. Before, this is now in the refectory, where everybody is eating. Before the food came onto the table, we always had a celebration and a recognition and honouring of the soil. This was all some of the compost that came out of the food preparation, and then obviously the bell, the candles, and water, because dead soil without water. Raz introducing the food, which is the first time that would ever happen, um, to all the students. But the plate of food, which always was quite bare and awakening, and it was vegetarian because it, that was the policy at the SI. First time that the actual cooks 
the people who served in the kitchen. The um, SI staff came and ate the food with the students. The students eating the food outside. And then we go on to the actual workshop. So they've had an experience in the morning, hands in soil, kitchen, lighting a candle, bringing in the spirit of place through the food, and then the workshop. So this particular workshop that I'm focusing on will be the wild cultures. So we made a relation, first thing I did was make a relationship with the local uh, organic and biodynamic gardeners and started to bring that into the SI and got a deal for them so that they could actually get the food that had been maybe gone to the market on the Saturday, which hadn't been sold, and the SI then were able to go on the Monday and get food at a much cheaper price. At that point, they were all buying in, most of the food was all from supermarkets and was aid food. So this was bringing fresh cabbages right into the heart, and, of, and we, that, that relationship has continued between the Green Road um, and uh, the Sustainability Institute. Everybody arrives. I invite them to um, an understanding what my research is and that we're all going on this research journey together and this is me sharing the consent forms. How have they come? How, how have they come to the workshop? How, how have they, they come? So the, 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 the wonderful thing about these workshops, so I would be documenting them, was that we absolutely had no idea who would come. Uh, the posters went up around the SI, it was on their Facebook page, their website, and because Nisha had been there for two months before, word of mouth had spread. So on the day, we would, well, you'd prepare the space and we'd wait, and typically, those who said they were going to come didn't, and instead, a lovely fresh crowd of people arrived who didn't know. Uh, and so, at, at this particular workshop um, is a mixture of students, agroecology students, based at the SI, um, a local agroecology trainer, a woman from a community project in the township we'd never met before but had heard about the project through a friend, um, uh, a, biodynamic. a biodynamic gardener, a young woman at the agroecology student, a, a visiting student from Stonebush University. So it was incredibly um, the organic the way that people arrived. Yeah, and in every single workshop that side worked. And then we went into the other space. So we had a, a, a dining room space. And we had a dining room space and we had a, a, a cafe space and the kitchen just basically, we had to go and forage and gather, find knives, there was no equipment but we found things, we got jars um, and then this was the beginning of the workshop so everybody was invited to hold a cabbage in their hand and to really get a feeling of it and to understand it and to treat it as um, delicately and fragilely as though it was their own head. And then I had a beautiful sort of, um, as people began to, to cut, I gave a sort of few demonstrations, um, and then people essentially went into their own um, process. And this was the first thing that happened after I'd given the introduction. This is Theo and Old John, who is the director of the um, Agroecology uh, Academy of the Sustainability Institute. He was not that then, no. but through our relationship, he um, became very involved and um, then became part of the academy. And he spontaneously. <laughs> Shosolosa is a train. This is a very political song. When Theo started singing this and everybody started responding, I knew that this was deep and real, what I was bringing, what we were bringing and sharing. This was one of his songs, Stimela. Actually, it's about all the, 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 that train 
brought all the, the miners to, um, to, to um, mine the gold. So it was a very difficult, difficult time. And to have this brought and reconfigured um, as a place of coming together through something that was really benign and actually um, of social significance was very meaningful. And then everybody was invited after the half an hour processing, everyone was invited to come and inquire into and discover what it had meant for them, what was going on for themselves. So they became their own researchers. And then they were invited to share their experiences with the partner. And then all together. And those were some of the effects. Uh, it takes about a week, but right there it was so hot, it takes about three days to ferment. And at the same time, Flora was describing all the um, responses. These are now experiences of a participant. So, um, yeah, just a little bit about my role as a thinking partner. It's been um, an amazing journey for me to witness this um, experience of you bringing your practice niche to the Sustainability Institute. And it's also been an amazing experience for us to develop and refine the kind of protocols and the challenges of our collaboration. Um, I did a PhD in my 20s and I was entrained by that process mm -hmm. to think in a certain way. And it's taken me almost to this day, 20 years, to actually free myself from some of that entrainment and actually not in any way intervene but simply support Leisha's thinking by listening, um, recording, documenting, drawing what I'm, I'm seeing and, and responding to invitation from you to think. But what was so moving for me about this process was I didn't have the responsibility to know what needed to happen next. I just had the responsibility to witness what was happening. So. Here I'm witnessing, it does make my hair stand on end, um, a, a young woman coming to ask, the confidence to ask for some quiet time with Mish to tell Mish about her experiences of uh, Mish being in residence. And her experience, very briefly, was that she's a young mother of two, she lives in the township, she every night has to cook for her family, and they only eat very sweet, sweetened food. So she makes uh, a pulp from um, the, the uh, butternut squashes. She has to sweeten it with um, sugar. She has to mash it. She has to get it to sort of process for her children to eat it and her partner to her husband to eat it. She tasted on the first of the three uh, sitting lunches, she, she refused to have any of the food. It was too unfamiliar. The second, she took some home and ate it. The third, she ate it with everybody. And she's come to tell Mish that it's changed her life because the way Mish cooked it was just to put it in the oven, take it out and cut it in half. And it's very delicious. So she does this now at home, she's telling Mish, and it means she has more time to be with her children. She uses less, she spends less money buying sugar and processed um, ingredients to add to it. And she now would like Mish to come to her compound and teach her family how to cook. So this is something that will happen. So this is part of the dialogue that happens after the workshop this is Jess, the director of the Sustainability Institute, who's a remarkable woman. And here Raz is experimenting with his first food citizenship lunch. So he's cooked this entirely on his own. And um, he surprised us. We yeah. just asked him to bring us some lunch, and he made that special for us, and we're having a meeting. And here G Jess is having some um, feedback time. She's been listening to her community the staff, and she's giving Mish feedback on how this residency is unfolding for her. Um, and here is Mish. Um, doing her um, dedicated chronicling that absolutely blows my mind that everything she thinks and says and does she records and there's a piece of as a part of paper just hard to do it um, and here is Mish then taking all of those experiences back to the SI while she's still there and saying this is what I've experienced this is the voices I've heard how does this resonate with you and then another a day spent interacting with all the staff the gardeners the cooks the teachers and slowly emerging what, what for them, what were the, the experiences for, for, for them of being on this research journey. And in that first drawing that Mish did uh, in March before the residency, 
There were aspirations that were written down and completely forgotten about. But what was lovely is when we returned to them at the very end, and Misha was looking through the, the, the transcriptions of what people had said, these were some of the things that people had aspired to at the beginning. I won't read them all, but it was about making visible the, the living food cycle, making visible the people in the garden who work and rarely are seen in the building, making visible the people in the kitchens cooking, making visible the waste, um, creating a gastronomy that people could relate to from all cultures. The gastronomy was what came from the garden. Uh, cooked simply, um, uh, co-host forums to begin to understand how the learning that was going on through the eating could actually inform the curriculum of the Agroecology Academy, and finally looking at how these methodologies might be integrated into the kind of outward policy work that the SI does, and that's, it did manifest, and you haven't got time today to share that, but we should then invite it back um, a few months later to host an Agroecology in Dharma which is, was a gathering of all the people training in agroecology in the region to actually try and innovate and cross-pollinate their teaching practices and their research practices. Thank you, Flora. It's beautiful. You see what the fantastic role of thinking partner has as well. It's like, I am not having to do everything. And that's made such a big difference. The spaciousness, the clarity, the fact that we can sort of um, really be touchstones for each other in all sorts of ways, not only just Laura do drawings that reflect some of what I've been doing. We can then invite ourselves into really what is going on in them. So it's been an extraordinary journey and it will continue. This was not just for my, um, we are thinking partners for each other as well in our collaboration. To end with this, I'd just like to have Professor Mark Swilling, who also was, had made was really instrumental in making this possible for me to do the research, and he got me the money to do the research with, uh, with, with Jess, and Jess, both they pulled resources in for me to do that and for, for Flora to accompany me. This is an extract from um, a poem that Mark wrote as a thank you to us after we had done that particular deep soup ceremony in the courtyard at Stonewash University's art school. And I love what it says. And through it all, memory surface of futures where art returns as a way of life, where all is in place, nothing brought in, for it's just simply there. All can do it. Know how is passed on, specialists are not needed, creating becomes the norm, for in that reconfiguration, peace prevails, conviviality thrives, all have a place, reconnected, and life unfolds. And so that's just to give you a little taste of a collaboration that came out of place, out of relationship, and formed part of my research as an artist. And obviously, to bring that back to call, um, it has been an, an honor, and the fact that Michelle came out and spent a couple of days while some of that was emerging, the pilot phase was emerging, was very meaningful and led to new meaningful relationships that are impacted on Paul and so much. So, you know, if you can't have a seminar without a ceremony, so... <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, who would like a glass of water? Who is hot and thirsty mm -hmm. and would like a drink? Yeah. Great. And while Flora was doing I'm realising that there were some things that we were in the start, we've got five, three minutes to start, mm -hmm. and let's... Let's just give a taste, but we would like to hear a bit more. What what is what has come through so far about the art of collaboration? What you've seen, things to share, things to dare to say. It's dirty and chaotic. <laughs> Some yeah. words I put online. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah, dirty and chaotic. Which is fun. Yeah. It is fun. Yeah. 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 It's convivial. It's convivial. And so that picture reminds me of conviviality and, and I think it's, it came out in many ways in different words. Mm. Like being friends and we are drinking together, that was about food. So I think that eating together is a very important component of collaboration. Mm. And I mean, conviviality is more than just eating together, but it's a very important part. I think food makes that connection, you know, even if you don't have the same vision about the world and some people like cars and others bicycles and others walk, but everyone has to eat, mm -hmm. isn't it? So it, it, has, it has that deeper connection.
connection also. I mean, you still have different tastes and some of the and whatever in general and so on. But it, it, I think it creates that collaboration platform. And I think you, yeah, you, you got into that in a way by, mm. by doing it, isn't it? Yeah. By making it, preparing it together as well. And Absolutely. Then, yeah, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah, it was powerful. And maybe to say that the rhythm of three was very important. If I'd just done one, mm. but it's like everyone knew first what was a day, so there was a cycle in the day that people, not everybody came to the same things. Some people did the gardening, some people did the cooking, some mm. people came to the workshops, it, but, but there was that, there was a kind of a resonance. And then there was, oh, there was one the next Wednesday. Oh, and if you missed that one, there was one the following Wednesday. And I think it was that idea of repetition mm. which made the difference for it to actually be embedded. <coughs> I think the slogan of the soil culture program was bringing the arts down to earth. Mm -hmm. And quite simply, it seems to me at this time, there's been a period when the contemporary arts particularly has become more and more irrelevant to many people. And what we really need to do is to employ artists to bring their art back into the everyday, because it's in the everyday where our life is, is, is becoming extremely difficult. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, without going into the lecture, you know, the word culture, you know, originated in the farming in the agricultural sense. Yeah. It didn't originate in the sense of the arts. Yeah. Um, you know, it was only used as a, as, as a, as a word which was an analogy, mm. which was generally suggests that you could improve the minds of people through exposure to the arts and to education. And so what we really need to do is to bring culture back out of the museums, back into everyday living. That's yeah, that's what yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what you do. That's yeah, and that's that's yeah. why I think in a way we've been given a very I won't say easy no, I'll say easy, but not simple task, because as Rick says, and as you're saying, Clive, actually, food does it all, but you have to, it takes the time, you know. There was a big issue still after we left, which is that the, the cook, because he became Raz, became so confident, but then he was put into a position where he had to be under somebody else, and it was like, why would I do this? I know what I need to do with my food now, so he moved on. So do I see that that's failed? Did I fail? Because now they don't have the cook who actually was cooking in the way that a food citizen would know. But no, because it was it's actually in the people. Any other sort of contributions or thoughts about any part of the research that anything else to be sure? I was just going to make a comment about this connection between aesthetics and ethics. Mm. And obviously you're using it in a very positive way through the aesthetics you're bringing, you know, reconnecting the food. But then I was thinking how traditional, well, I'll say traditional, but what is the norm in the, in the UK, for example, how that link between aesthetics and ethics gets broken mm -hmm. and how, so it's not that they're not artistic in, yeah. their, in, their, in their means, they are maybe, um, they use the aesthetic in a certain way to hide the ethics of yeah. a particular, the source of the food, of mm. the animal origins of, origins of the food. Of, yeah. So it's a different set of aesthetic practices that, yeah. that industry is very good at engaging with mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and to be wary of. So I'm just, I, I guess, not to see art necessarily as the way out, but to see you know, the right type of art and how it's been appropriated in bad ways by other actors. Yeah. It's really important that, that you're raising that and flagging it up because in going back to the understanding and the origins of the word aesthetic, um, as I spoke about, it's about feeling form. But I also went back to the origins of the word ethics. And as you say, I mean, if, if you really want to know how to make something work, go and look at advertising because they know what works. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the, 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 the kind of the, the, um, the, the visuals, the, liter the literacy of advertising, mm -hmm. they've, got, they, they've figured it out. Um, so how do, you, how do you make it work? that's actually not aestheticizing, but mm. making it aesthetic in the true feeling form um, understanding. But then the um, origins of the word ethics comes from ethos. And if you go back to the origins of the word ethos, ethos comes from um, aesthetics values coming from place. Mm. 
<coughs> and so when I started realizing that um, an ethos is actually about people knowing what's right, knowing what's truth, knowing what's good, if you are connected to place. And Nick will know all about this because a lot of that, his work is about that. I'm just thinking about the, um, the day that you uh, organised for our Conversations with the Earth Community Festival in Oxford, 2011, something like that. <clears throat> and how important the ceremony is in, in your work mm -hmm. and how that takes, in my personal experience, and my family and friends who are there, <clears throat> elevates the whole experience mm -hmm. to a, another level mm -hmm. of actually being very emotional mm -hmm. and deep. Mm -hmm. um, so having the, the, uh, the bowls of soil <clears throat> in the different the four directions, mm -hmm. taken from local organic farms with the produce that they donated for the event, mm -hmm. the connection, I mean, it's that holistic mm. nature of, 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 of your, uh, the way you work, which is very important to help us all re reconnect and remember mm. that the soil is part of food. Mm. <coughs> um, we think about distance and all these things without being too obvious. Mm. <coughs> it, it, much, it works on a much more powerful level when you have that mm. level of food. Mm. So there's a certain reverence mm. that um, I, I could see that in the photos I was recognizing the way you work with holding the cabbage, you know. Yeah. You didn't have that was an amazing it's it's, it's simple, quite kind of maybe a bit weird. Weird, totally. But so yeah. important. Yeah. If you didn't have that moment in yeah. the in the in the process, yeah, totally. you'd lose a huge amount. Totally. So it, And it made people laugh. Yeah. Treat the cabbage as your head. Well that's and the then you've got to cut it. <laughs> you know. That's yeah. the other side of it. Yeah. Because to be too sort of serious and yeah, yeah. worthy. Yeah, yeah. And also put people off as a really fine balance. You yeah. take a lot of risks with your work. There are moments of discomfort, and that's a part of it. <coughs> Thank you. I wonder. Sorry. No, please do go. I wonder if the discomfort with the ritual aspects of your work, like when I think about when I've experienced discomfort, is because if I really held the egg and let myself connect with what you're saying, then the whole world has to change. Because and I think that's where some people just have to shut down because the implications are too enormous. Mm -hmm. if, if you say, I'm really going to connect with everything that I eat, mm -hmm. as if I grew it myself, as if I cherished that chicken, or as if I, that was the only cabbage that came up this winter, mm -hmm. you know, then the whole world has to change. And I think there's a sort of embarrassment mm -hmm. with that. And um, I remember sort of Wallace Hyam, some of you may have read her stuff, environmental philosophy talking about there can be a sort of disgust reaction which is like I don't we're we're in we're in the north, we're in the global north, we, we don't have to think like this. We can buy our oranges ready peeled from Marks and Spencer's, we don't have to think about this. There's a sort of attraction repulsion aspect to the ritual dimension which is kind of interesting because you make this offering and then there can there can be a, a, a sort of yeah. kickback yeah. which is should be a useful it is uh, tension yeah. that is released. And and to have it voiced is very important, and we did. You know, there were people who felt just even the lighting of the candle was far too religious and far too sanctimonious. Mm -hmm. And it and this was all a bit too positive, a bit too exaggerated. Um, it couldn't be a part of the ordinary day. So, but I think what I love about um, doing this work is that I'm not trying to change anybody. I'm just doing what I love doing. And if people want to be part of that, and I share my practice, people came because they chose to, came, to come. And it's that beautiful quote, I think the nice way to end this mm -hmm. part, mm -hmm. is um, uh, Buckminster Fuller saying that um, if you are looking to um, make a new world, don't try and dismantle the old, just make the new. And I trust that we are just, mm -hmm. in a way, it's not even the new, we're, we're, we're remembering the old. So I thank you all for your incredible attention and presence. It's wonderful that you've been here and had a more deeply experience of what we're doing and hopefully we'll continue thinking about the art of collaboration every time you have your little touchstone in your hand. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to bring this to a close with a little ceremony and, yeah. uh, and um, gratitude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Miss, can I invite you to do the ceremony? I'd love to. Yeah. And maybe before a few thanks. Thanks to Ben yeah. for having kind of made this all possible to be um, seen beyond where we are today. Um, Michelle.
May we invite you up here? Okay. What, what we're marking, I'll just, well, I, shall I speak a little bit? Yes, you please do. What's so um, wonderful is we're marking today a gentle uh, little launch of an initiative that um, has come out of our relationship with uh, CORE and also our relationship with um, the Sustainability Institute and Stellenbosch University's Centre for Complex Systems in Transition, which Professor Mark Swilling heads up and collaborates with Rika Prizer, Dr. Rika Prizer, who you will all meet. Um, and it's not a kind of launch in the sense that we've quietly around the corner built a large ship, which we're now <laughs> plunging into the water with a bottle of champagne. This is literally the planting of a seed. Um, it's a seed that we know um, has been called for. So the people we've worked with have said, can we carry on? And we've been venturing out and talking to other folks. Um, Clive, we've been speaking with you, we've been um, meeting with service providers, we've been meeting with other artist practitioners. And this theme of the art of collaboration, as you said, um, Nick, the dark and the light, the, 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 the intimacy, the politics, the practices, what's it all about? And I think we, we spoke briefly to you, Ben, yesterday about it, and the idea being that we have an incredible ingenuity, we have incredible technical knowledge, we have incredible desire, we have incredible kind of consensus that time has come to change, recover, restore, reconnect. But the, but the, the, the intimate detail of how we do that, particularly, as you were saying, across difference, across when, as you say, we have we must hasten slowly. We have all the time in the world, and also we need to act. So we are looking to, um, with the support um, of many people who have not been able to be here today, with Carol's support, with Michelle's support, with the support of our collaborators in Southern Africa, we are going to be holding a project called Art of Collaboration as artist researchers here at CORE. It's at the moment envisaged as a five-year arc of reciprocal engagement between the Global South and the Global North, at the moment, the, the, these are our, our, our birthing partners. It's this <laughs> beloved um, place we're in now. Blessings. Um, this is our new home where Touchstones breathes in it's Suffolk. Our little studio. And this is our little studio. I'm doing my PhD from and this final is a, stages. A farmstead that we are envisaging, or we're guardians of, and we're envisaging being a, a, a place where people can come on an active retreat. Um, this is the Centre for Complex Systems in Transition. Here is is uh, Mark Swilling, and here is the Sustainability Institute. So we thank these places as well as these people. Um, and this is a screenshot of the emerging website. This is a picture taken in 2012 of Mish working with a young um, actor called Billy Langer on the Hands and Soil project. And there's a poster of it up out in the um, corridors. T-shirt says, the future's in our hands, the future's in the soil. And this is one of the most lively collaborations we've ever done. This young man in his Heart of, Heart of Johannesburg. It's a fire town, Heart of Johannesburg. He taught me more about soil, love, collaboration. And I freely confess that I am the learner in this journey. Um, and so we're launching this. It's going to be a, a project that um, lives through, emerges through collaboration. So everything that you've said and shared today will feed into, be folded into the project. Um, and, and the are, website is hosted by Court with our under our our host is, is sort of shared by. We will curate it, it and it, it will be linked from the Core website, and it's going to be called Art of Collaboration dot Earth. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to launch it now. We will be launching it in Southern Africa in, in a similar intimate way. But we just really thank you all so deeply for being here. Not just today, but you've all been on the journey with us, and we trust we'll all be on the journey with each other in the future. It's a deeply honouring experience. And I think also just to um, note too that the person that um, introduced me to Michelle is my beloved friend Nick um, from Oxford, and we met doing sand play and working with young uh, youth a youth centre. And I think it's beautiful to have um, arts, uh, 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 Coventry Arts with Sarah Watley being here, and our beloved Clive as well. So we're bringing, we're bringing the arts and the sciences right into um, the centre of core. And the next thing will be a studio, of course, but not until I finish my PhD. We don't know where that's going to be or how it's going to be. We might even build it ourselves. <laughs> and then Jane Trowell also has just been an incredible supporter of um, our work and does work with a, a, an outfit, a, a, a 
an art initiative, an ecology initiative, very political, called Platform. So if you want to look up and see what's happening around oil and how the art, how artists can impact on oil and on rivers and the Thames, check out Platform as well. And then Nick, your your um your um uh, is your insight insa is insight share and does work. Yeah, participatory video work. Um, and it's also going to be here, hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all so to all of our, yeah, to all and for Ulrich also is incredible is is based here and has also very profoundly influenced and and dedicated to our work when we did a a, a retreat at Sheep Grove where we all came to look at transdisciplinarity and we were invited to have a, a little studio space to just really open up to not knowing lots of very very key. Um, and wonderful processes happened, but we had a process where basically we had a room and if people came, it was great, and if they didn't, it was fine. And some people came to do nothing. And that we felt was as important as the incredible ferment of ideas that went on. So, and of course, Julia, who brought us together by inviting us to share what we were doing in South Africa in 2013. And then, Francis, with permission, may I read your, what you wrote on the pushing line? Yeah, if you want to. And then we will do the final. As, as the yeah. to learn. No, you can read it. Francis was part of that very first, first uh, event, actually. Fantastic image of a spaghetti mm -hmm. jumper. Mm -hmm. Nobody could build this on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's our anthem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I'd love to invite Michelle to light the candle to this um, launching of the Art of Collaboration and for us all to um, share good wishes inside ourselves um, about how we might all be able to contribute to its flourishing. Any words? The only words I'd say, I think it's great that this is possible and that we're making it possible. And that's important. It sounds very um, trivial at one level, but it's extremely important mm -hmm. to be able to bring this diversity and, and dare to travel on this journey, knowing that there are many pitfalls, there are many risks, um, but it's possible to have lots of fun in the process, yeah. so that's great. Um, and my final word, because I will have to rush out and see Richard Dashwood, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, is that you're all invited um, for more food, more rituals out there. And um, if some of you leave, I just want to thank you for coming along. It's been a very, very good moment together, and I hope we can renew this in some of these places. There we are. Thank you, Mish. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you all for coming. So we can, I mean, we can, you, you've got your head, yeah. um, but we probably can bring this to a close, but, you know, we can continue um, in our time out in the garden.